Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Design and Management Consulting Panel, moderated by our own consulting guru, Mary Beck. This panel will explore how the consulting industry uses design principles to bring value to clients. And with that, Mary Beck, please take it away. Valerie, thank you so much. I'm so privileged to be oh, moderating this panel today. And we have such a great uh, hour plus ahead of us to learn so much more about design consulting and the panelists. I know that all of you will enjoy so well, so much. Uh, again, my name is Mary Beck White Sutton. I have been at Fuqua for 20 years and I'm the sector director of consulting. And I too look forward to understanding more about the field of design consulting and also how design consulting intersects with uh, traditional management consulting. So uh, with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists. Um, Prior to doing that, I do want to provide a little bit of an outline of this next hour and 15 minutes. Uh, so we'll have panelist introductions, then we'll have discussions, uh, question for the, uh, questions for the panelists, and about uh, towards the end of the time together, I'd say around 215, 220, we'll actually have questions from, uh, from the audience. So please, please send your questions into the chat box, and we because we would really like to answer those prior to our hard stop at 2.30. So again, I'm going to now turn this over to the panelists for a brief introduction for each. Mariella, I'll go ahead and start with you first. Fantastic, thank you, Mary Beck. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mariela. So I am originally from Costa Rica. Uh, I was a daytime MBA student at Fuqua. I graduated 2018. Um, so while I was there, I was one of the co-presidents of the Design and Innovation Club. So we're very excited to, to be part of this, of this panel. Um, so before Fuqua, I worked uh, in traditional uh, st strategy and operations consulting at PwC. And I also did uh, innovation consulting at a boutique firm that did um, innovation and strategy design, um, uh, innovation design strategy uh, using storytelling. When I went to Fuqua, I knew that I wanted to get back into the world of design and innovation. In full honesty, it wasn't the easiest recruiting path to, to go down on. Um, doing non-traditional recruiting is, is not the easiest thing, but I'm very happy to say that it all worked out. And I ended up joining BCG Digital Ventures, which is BCG's corporate venturing arm. Um, I was there for two and a half years. So I started in, in the Manhattan Beach office in LA. Uh, then I had to move to Singapore uh, because of my H-1B visa it didn't come through. So I had to move to Singapore, which is where I am now. Um, so a little, Short little background on DV. Um, so at DV, we don't really think of ourselves as consultants. Uh, yeah, we do client services, but we actually build new ventures with our corporate partners, right? So we take something from an idea, we validate it, and then we build uh, a new startup, and then we launch it out into the world. Um, so I've worked on so many different ventures. Hopefully, I'll get some time to, to talk about some of them. Um, but this January, I decided to join one of the ventures that I worked on uh, as part of DV. Um, so now I'm at Affinity, which is a decentralized digital identity uh, startup here in Singapore. Um, and I transition actually to be a product manager, but I still use my design skills every single day. Um, so yeah, super excited to be here. It's 2 a.m. in the morning here in Singapore. So hopefully that shows my love for Fuqua and for the Design Innovation Club. So super excited to, to um, share with you guys today. Well, I can definitely uh, concur there. Our love for you back and, and for the uh, speak for the club as well and for all the participants. Thank you so much for really making that sacrifice on our behalf. Uh, Silky, would you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Silky Kadakia. It's wonderful to be here. I'm really excited to be um, on this esteemed panel with, with these colleagues as well as just to hear from everyone here. Um, I'm currently an innovation manager at Bain Companies um, Adapt, which is our advanced digital and product studio within the, within the broader ecosystem. Um, my background has always been in innovation and design. I actually started in strategy consulting, but had a design background. So very early into my career was bridging that gap um, and has have helped essentially build different studios within consulting firms. I've had my own consultants, consultancy and then did a few product stints as well along the way. Um, I have a master's from Parsons in strategic design and management and um, have been at Bain for a little over a year and a half and I'm based out of New York. So I'm excited to share some experiences in here, here um, from others as well. Thank you, Zioki. 
Uh, then we are so privileged to have Dr. Joe Golden with us. Uh, Joe, please uh, introduce yourself as well. Sure. Hi, I'm Joe Golden. I am a portfolio design director at Accenture, at Accenture Federal Services. And within that company, I am with the Fjord Design and Innovation Group. So I oversee all kinds of design projects and all of our work at AFS is for the federal government in the U.S. So that means we, um, our customers are government workers as well as the public in the United States. So that is amazing and definitely changes um, a lot of how we do our work. I think from a design perspective, because we have such a broad base for all of the services and products that we're delivering. So that's really meaningful and exciting work. I would say most of the folks who come to AFS and join us really want to um, make a difference. And that is a key component, I think, of working for the government. And it's a really exciting time to be there. And before that, I had my own company for 15 years. Um, my PhD is in conflict analysis and resolution, which I use all the time <laughs> in all the things that I've ever done, uh, because where there are humans, there are conflicts. And that is part of why we are so extraordinarily creative, but, you know, it can also go sideways. So we have to think about how to find that balance. But, um, and I would say the other thing that's useful to know is that I teach at MICA at the Maryland Institute College of art and I've been teaching design leadership there for um, four or five years. So that's my ongoing piece of academia because I never really want to let it go. Yeah, I can't imagine. Uh, thank you so much, Joe. And there's such a great thread of creativity and innovation and entrepreneurism throughout the panelists. Sonia, please close it out for us. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Sonia Norris and I am um, Originally from Kazakhstan and Russian speaking, uh, moved to the US in 2009. And I'm uh, a Duke MBA student, graduated at, uh, in 2011. And actually post-graduation, I ended up in the tech industry. I worked in uh, program management and also management consulting at Infosys and Accenture. And within management consulting, I focused uh, mostly on digital transformation projects within financial services and insurance industry. And, um, you know, and digital, digital consulting is a very broad area, but what appealed to me uh, are projects that are, uh, were connected to user experience, uh, reimagining the user journey and uh, reimagining the, re reinventing the product. So uh, I decided to move to a pure product management role because there was a couple of roles uh, within my consulting experience where I was a product manager and I really enjoyed it. And I actually have then moved to a couple of, I had an opportunity to work in a couple of startups afterwards. So one of them was a boutique consulting firm, uh, Centric Digital, which is based in New York. And um, it was interesting because we actually did focus on digital strategy and product management. So I was able to, to do both. And then I moved to another startup, uh, which currently is called uh, XR Labs, uh, which is mixed reality labs in, uh, at Verizon. So it was a startup incubated by Verizon and we experimented with uh, virtual and augmented reality. So that was a very valuable experience in a way that I had a chance to work um, in an environment which is very different from a consulting environment. So this startup was uh, founded by engineers, was led by engineers. So it was an entirely different mindset. So, and um, I uh, eventually moved to McKinsey and right now I'm a product manager for uh, McKinsey. And within McKinsey, I'm focusing on the um, portfolio of internal products and to be more specifically on knowledge management products. Mm. So very excited to be here, uh, you know, so many years since. <laughs> it, has, it has, and we're so delighted to have you and have all, uh, all the panelists. So let's get started with some questions. Um, design consulting is by no means new. IDEO was founded in 19, 1991, and many of the firms followed suit over the next decade. 
With that said, it's not the most well-known path, especially for MBAs. Please share how you discovered or carved out your own design consulting path. Um, Marielle, I'll start out with you. Uh, sure. So I, I feel like I've always been very deliberate about what I want to do, right? So early on in my career, I chose to forego the, the typical roles that were available to me as an industrial engineering grad, which was basically manufacturing uh, most of the time. Um, so I wanted to pursue something that was more creative, uh, a bit more inspiring. So uh, I decided to wait and, and, and find something that, that met uh, a few of my, of my checklists. Um, so I was very lucky to join this, this boutique consulting firm that I mentioned at the beginning um, that did innovation and design strategy using storytelling. So here I learned about ethnographic research, about narratives and archetypes, user experience, design strategy. Uh, and it was a, a wonderful experience. I then transitioned to BWC, like a very dramatic shift. Uh, I wanted to develop, like broaden my skill set, But the reality is I had already been bitten by the design bug and I knew that I wanted to, to get back into design. Um, and, and I think here, I sometimes wonder uh, why I didn't go then to do a, a design degree, right? I was, not, I was not a formally trained designer. I had learned some stuff on the job. Uh, and yet I wanted to get back and I, and I decided to go to Fuqua and do a traditional MBA. And I think even at that time, I, I understood that uh, the power of, of being more of a, of a generalist and somebody that can see the problem from, from multiple different perspectives. And very pragmatically, I knew that if design didn't work and I had to like go back home, an MBA would, would be a valuable, a valuable asset to have. Um, so I then, as I said, I, I pursued a, a design career and I joined BCG DV as a strategic designer. And I think this idea of, I really believe that business needs design and design needs business. So, so I've, I've actually found a lot of value in being a, a traditional MBA, uh, but, but pursuing a, a career in, in design. Um, so yeah, it's a bit, it, I always say, tell people that uh, I, like, I have a, a weird path, but honestly, all of my colleagues that are strategic designers, or most of them tend to have weird, unique paths as well. So by no means is there like a straight line from, oh, you do A, B, C, and then you get, you get, there's like any path is, is possible, I think. Thank you, Marilyn. I just wanted to see if anyone else wanted to share, uh, share their experiences before we jump to the next question. My experience. Um, by the way, am I audible? Am I? Can you hear me well? Oh, sorry. Can you uh, talk up just a little bit? Uh, yes. Okay. So is it better now? It's it's better. It is. Uh huh. Just a, a little bit higher volume. Okay. So uh, sorry for the technical glitch. So is oh, it no, better now? Fine. Okay. Awesome. So uh, I actually, you know, when I graduated from Fuqua, I, you know, had no idea I would end up on this path at all. And as I mentioned, I started uh, in an IT consulting firm, which is Infosys. And um, uh, as I moved to management consulting, I noticed that uh, there were a lot of work and demand for work in this intersection of industry and digital uh, design. And, um, and so uh, basically when you get on uh, this kind of engagements, you, uh, you're just not like a consultant. You cannot be just a consultant. You have to think about the design process more holistically. So you have to think about the users, uh, user-centered design. How would you structure the design process properly? How would you involve the uh, design team? And how would you collaborate with the client? So I think that actually appealed to me, that side of, um, of uh, this design uh, career appealed to me because you know, I also have another degree, which is uh, Master's in Human Rights. And I think that focus on user uh, and then empathy for the user, because obviously a good product should meet the user needs, um, really appealed to me. So that was kind of like that, that how my path changed from consulting to product management. So thank you for, for sharing that very, very much. Um, 
I think I'll just move on to our to our next question. Um, what do you wish more people knew about the intersection of traditional management consulting and the design and innovation consulting field? Joe, do you want to tackle this one? Yes, I'd be happy to. I what I wish people knew is more about the synergies and the differences because in management consulting, and I am not classically trained, but the folks that I teach are getting a dual master's in design leadership and an MBA at Johns Hopkins. So there I'm familiar with, you know, some of the way the thinking works. And um, there's a lot of focus on having answers and less focus on co-creating those answers with your clients, with all the stakeholders, with the people involved. And I think that is the real power that design brings is that focus on deep understanding um, through research, ethnographic research, um, blending qualitative and quantitative research, but also um, by that process of co-creating together and not having to be the smartest person in the room, which, you know, it's really a relief and it's really fun. And I have a lot of degrees and I really love not being the smartest person in just about any room because everybody is, they, you know, people bring their own knowledge of their world to this. And I think that means really honoring and respecting it, respecting it. And um, as someone who's been in academia a long time as well, I understand that um, there's not always the respect perhaps as a designer I would like to see for people's understanding of their world. And so I think um, those are some things I wish there was more understanding about, not just that, hey, this is great, but about the value of um, sitting with ambiguity and co-creating with your stakeholders and really um, learning from the folks who are experts on their own experience. Beautifully said, Joe. Uh, anyone else like to share any of their thoughts before we? Before yeah, I, I, yeah, I think I, I completely agree. And I think it's from my perspective, it's it's like it depends on the type of problem that you're trying to solve. Right. So uh, there is there's problems that traditional management consulting looks to solve that do not need uh, right design innovation mindsets. But there's a lot that that can benefit from it, especially when the problems to solve are like the path forward is not clear. Mm -hmm. There is not one right solution. And when your problem or the solution to your problem will impact people, that's when I think those characteristics make it so that uh, a design mindset is going to be super valuable, right? Because design thinking allows you to make decisions based on what on what the end user and your customers actually want rather than just trusting your gut or historical data, right? It's all about understanding them and then uh, and then experimenting and finding the answer. And as Joe said, co-creating with them. Um, so I think if you find the right type of problem, that's, that's when uh, design thinking really, really becomes uh, uh, a mega tool that adds a lot of value. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mariella. Oh. I'm going to the next question. Where else do you think design and innovation can be useful for management consulting? Where is it not currently employed? Silky, I'm going to kick that off for you to provide some insight to. I think the, I think both Mariella and Joe kind of talked about this where mm -hmm. it's not, I think there's a lack of understanding potentially that exists right now in terms of the power of design thinking and or design and innovation and how it can actually help answer certain questions or help kind of tackle certain problems. And that's kind of the first barrier is people don't really understand how to employ it. Um, and so once we cross that, then you start to open up and see how many problems there are that can have a design mindset when you're coming to approach it. That being said, to Mariella's point, not everything needs to go down the design thinking path. And you know there are tried and true ways of solving certain issues. Um, I think a, a common thing that I notice is, you know the power of a design mindset that's not just for B2C types of problems, but also to B2B problems or internal issues. Um, when we think of innovation, it's not always just a new product that comes out or a new service, right? There's a lot of little nuances that, you know, you could be innovating with and a lot of problems that actually can use and benefit from those principles in terms of how we look at a process differently or how you improve something for an internal organization differently. Um, and so I think there's a lot of a lot of misconceptions in terms of like, what are the types of really interesting problems that use this type of methodology. But when you actually peel back the layers, it's really 
how do you use a certain mindset and skill set to really approach a problem from a different angle? Mm -hmm. Sonia, did you have any thoughts about that or? Right, I was just, um, I could give like a more uh, specific example. For example, within uh, McKinsey, we do work on uh, asset, uh, we are creating assets that basically we are productizing and then we use those products um, um, over and over again, you know, to uh, provide uh, some insights for, uh, for the client. And I think some of these uh, products are very technical, very sophisticated, and for example, they're experimenting with, you know, cutting edge AI or machine learning, this kind of stuff. And what I noticed that uh, traditionally they would be start, they would they would be started or led by uh, data by data scientists and uh, like one of the consultants who knows the industry really well. But I think what is missing sometimes is the component of the design approach, because when you build a product, you need to um, understand the needs of you know, multiple stakeholders, not just like the uh, executives or the client, for example, executives, clients, but also the end users, right, who would be using the product. So that's where I see where there is um, a gap. However, I think it also maybe corresponds to this conversation that you will be, this uh, question you will be asking later about the trends. In terms of, you know, the trend, maybe what I'm seeing is the need or demand of, uh, for people who actually understand the design approach, but also have, has, have some specialized knowledge. We have a deeper knowledge in a specific area, such as, for example, data science or data analytics, just as an example. Yeah, thank you. I think specific examples are very helpful to the audience too as they're trying to parse this out. Um, we're, we have a bit of a theme here as we're kind of comparing this to traditional management consulting, but I think it is important to also ask, um, we've touched on this a bit, but what are some surprising challenges and or benefits of collaboration? I mean, it's important, you know, to, to have collaboration uh, with the more traditional management consulting side of the business. Um, Mary Ellen, I'll or ask you if you want to kick that one off and others can jump in. Sure. Sure. So I think the reality is that traditional consultants are, are trained to solve problems in a very different way than the way designers are taught to solve problems. And that's simply because of the nature of the problems that each one is tasked to solve, right? So it's not that one approach is better than the other, it's just different approaches for different types of problems. Um, and each one works very well with, with uh, the specific type of problem. So uh, at DV, um, something that, I, that, was, that was actually really cool is when DV uh, and, BC, and traditional BCG teams work well together, it works amazingly well. Uh, that's not to say that it's the easiest process in the world, but uh, let me give you an example. So uh, I worked on a, on a venture where we're basically designing a, a digital bank from scratch for a, for a corporate partner that was not a bank, right? Uh, so as a strategic designer, I focus on understanding people's pain points around their current banks, uh, what they cared about in terms of banking and financing, um, like what were their, their, their needs and their hopes and all these things, right? Uh, and then I designed features and products and experiences to solve those, those pain points. And then we tested these out with, with real customers to discover what worked and what didn't and, and sort of co-create as, as Joe was talking about. And the BCG team on the other hand, so they were amazing at understanding like the regulatory and financial requirements for starting a bank. The financial model for this thing was insane. And, and DV could have never could have never built that. That's that's the truth, right? Um, so I think when when you use both sides skills in the right way, it's incredibly powerful. Some of the challenges inevitably are like working in new ways feels uncomfortable, right? And for somebody who's used to bringing uh, the answer, uh, being answer first and us saying like, no, no, we don't know the answer. The answer will come as we go. That is super uncomfortable for them, super uncomfortable. So I think you have to uh, sort of sometimes educate the other side of the table on what are the methods that you are using and why they are valuable and why are they are different. Uh, but once you build that trust with each other, the team is unstoppable. But 
there are sometimes <laughs> challenges with, with building that trust at the beginning. I cannot agree with you more given the, the training of going in there and knowing the answer or figuring it out pretty quickly versus that ambiguity of moving on the journey together to figure it out. That's certainly a wonderful way to, excellent way to describe it. Uh, didn't know if anyone else had a, a other thoughts with it before we go on. Um, yeah, I think I can yeah, still, chime in. Oh. In terms of uh, one of one of the challenges is that uh, you know very often you, for example, you want to um, uh, conduct some sort of core creation or design thinking exercise with the client, right? And usually you would operate within the constraints of traditional management consulting, such as it's a specific timeline, it's a set timeline, and um, your stakeholders are only available for let's say one day if you want to do a co-creation workshop, and you you know you don't have like six weeks to conduct proper user research, so you have maybe two weeks to conduct user research. So basically, there will be kind of like a lot of discrepancies between what you can do in reality and what is the by the book right, let's say design, uh, design approach or let's say design sprint, for example, which is like a five day sprint where all stakeholders and users are involved, fully involved and you, you, you come up with it. So basically you have to kind of adjust it to the real life situation and you know, to big corporations as well, because in big corporations, you know, there is no way you can get executives for five days in a row and put them you know, in a workshop for five days. So you may have them for three hours. So you need to make sure you get the best out of it within this three hours, right? So uh, that's the challenge because you know, perfect, uh, usually not feasible in reality. But the benefit of it is that uh, it forces you to actually stay focused on the actual outcome of your design process. Because if you, ask people to spend so much effort and time uh, in, on this process, then they would expect a very tangible, very valuable outcome. So it kind of makes you think about what you're trying to achieve and um, also it, uh, forces you to be more efficient. Right? So because the whole process cannot drag and it can, you, you kind of like have to cut down on more fluffy pieces, right? And just get to the meat of it faster. So. Basically, that's the challenge and the benefit that I have seen from my experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Silke, did you have anything to add to it? Or, uh... I, was, I was just going to quickly say, you know, I've been in this world for, for a number of, of years now and seeing kind of what it looks like at two different management consulting firms. Um, I think it would be silly for us to think that this is a surprising challenge. I think when you think of design and innovation, no matter if it's in management consulting or in industry, I think this is a known challenge that is part of the part of the job description. I think the idea of bringing in a new way of thinking is always going to be a cultural and process challenge. And so I think if you're going into this field, knowing that that's going to be a core part of whatever experience you're going down is, is important. Um, and so I think, I think that's the only thing is that, yes, these are challenges, but I, I imagine these are probably pretty, pretty known and regularly experienced by everyone that's kind of in this, in this world. Agree. Thank you. Um, well, this is a question I just love of uh, being a career coach and having been one for many years, but what excites you most about your job? Uh, what is the favorite part of your job and what is the most challenging aspect of it? So we've got what excites us the most, the favorite part and most challenging. Joe, I'm going to start with you. Uh, let you kick that off. Well, the answer to all three of those is people. Okay. <laughs> because as a social scientist, people are and all of their things are what gets me up in the morning. So I think that is a really interesting piece. So in terms of being able to um, really push methodologies, push um, our understanding of the types of things we can do and the problems we can solve, those are the people on the teams. And that is really exciting. I work with, um, I don't know, like uh, more than 150 different designers and rapid prototypers and data scientists. And 
it's amazing when you combine all those skill sets, the types of things that, that you can do. And so it's, and it's always a learning moment. I don't think I ever get past that. Um, and it's always a challenge to figure out um, how to solve those problems in a way that actually works for the business. And, and that's really interesting. Um, the biggest challenges come with people's uh, mindsets and their current mental models, which would be around that idea of how things are supposed to work and how perhaps um, we don't really need time from stakeholders because we should just figure it out because there is a sense sometimes, um, you know, people are used to having a problem solved by other people. We live in a service oriented economy, right? We can farm out everything, but you can't farm out certain types of design work. People have to participate. And I think that is a big challenge is um, conveying that understanding and doing it in a way that speaks to the particular set of people that you need to convince that they need to come and you know play with everyone else and figure this thing out. So I think that um, is a big challenge. So exciting, challenging, what was the third one? Sorry, but always people. Exciting. <laughs> exciting uh favorite part of it and and challenging yeah yeah my favorite part is that changing hearts and minds and when you see people shift how they were looking at something or you see a skeptic who comes up to you and said why in god's name did nobody tell us this six months ago or a year ago and why weren't we doing it this way from the start and all you can do is sit there and smile and say, I am so happy to hear you say that <laughs> because it's that that is a beautiful thing about design is it's a visceral experience because you're in it right with both feet in the scary part, in the hard part, um, in the easy parts, in the curious parts. And so to hear that from clients and from other stakeholders is fantastic. And, you know, they always attribute it to the team and yep. Like I said, I work with great teams and the teams are doing this stuff, but it's also, um, it's, it's bringing that process to life and being able to trust that process that I think is really, really fascinating and important and exciting. So those are my favorite things, the changing hearts and minds. Thank you so much. Uh, now, would anyone else like to come in about their, this question? I'm sure you all have other thoughts too. Uh, anybody else? If not, we'll move forward. Okay. All righty. Um, thank you, Joe. That's excellent. And changing hearts and minds, I think people would agree with that. It's always wonderful to provide something new and have the light bulb go off for someone. Um, what project or product are you most proud of and why? If you're able to talk about this, because you know a lot of us are not or have a bit of uh, some constraints around our uh, discussing our projects and our products, but um, uh, Silky, do you, I see your, do you want to kick, kick us off with that? Sure. Um, I will try to make this as tangible as possible for everyone um, without, uh, as much as I can. Um, the most interesting project that I, I actually just wrapped up um, was super powerful for all of the reasons that I think, Joe, you just mentioned the people and the results that we were able to see was really impressive. Um, Essentially, the problem statement we were trying to solve for was we were working with a um, security company, and they were really trying to understand what's a future product that could be consumer facing that people want to buy to protect something. So there's a number of questions there. What do people want to protect? What is the future of protection? What is the future of how people think about this particular sentiment? Um, what could they do to be different than their competitors? There's a number of business reasons why they were kind of going down this path. Um, and, you know, it was, a, it was a really interesting problem for, for one, because not only are we innovating something new for this company, but we're also trying to understand what is the market going to look like? How does consumer behavior really shift? What are some macro trends that will be impacting um, the community, as well as just understanding how technology and other things are changing. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we went through this process, stuck tr true to a, a, design, um, a design process. We were working alongside a traditional Bain team as well. And so kind of both, both sides coming together to really solve this problem. And to Mariella's point, it was really powerful as a result 
to be able to do that because not only were we thinking about it from kind of a user centric, customer centric perspective, but we were also validating everything with like a financial model and doing quantitative testing and really kind of putting the numbers behind some of the, the ideation process. Um, and a couple really key moments of unlock and to Joe's point in terms of like when things start to kind of have light bulbs in our clients' eyes and the rest of our team's eyes is we did a, a robust ethnography process where we were um, you know, interviewing and, and talking to a number of different individuals. And once we put that all together, it was the first time that I think there was a concise view of what their customers felt and what they really had problems with that I think the company kind of new, but to hear voices and to actually see what that looks like really galvanized the organization in a different way, which was really powerful and essentially gave us the trust and agency to be able to do all of the next steps of the design process. And so even though, you know, perhaps there was an answer or a hypothesis of what the solution should be from the client side or from the traditional Bain side, I think once you provide that voice of here's what actually people are concerned about, it gives you a lot more kind of agency in terms of um, how we ideate and how we bring people into our process. And so soon after that, we really had a tight relationship with our client where we were going through ideation sessions and really kind of doing the diverging and then converging of ideas. Um, we had a number of different concepts that we were testing both qualitatively and quantitatively, and then we're able to land on something that was really powerful that all of us felt really interested in and had a lot of conviction. We clearly had the customer data to back that up. And then the clients were super thrilled for it too. Um, and so it was one of those powerful moments where, you know, in the future, if this product comes out, I would be the first one to buy it. And that's really powerful and exciting for me just to see that, you know, there's an actual problem, perhaps one that we also feel as consumers and have worked towards getting a company towards a, a, a new potential, um, mission and, and, and product that could be changing a lot of people's um, lives and relationship with how they want to protect themselves. So. I appreciate the example because, you know, it's interesting when you develop something, you also want to be a user of it too. And if you're excited about it, I mean, you're part of this whole creation. And uh, so thank you for, for that example too, uh, Silky. Um, anyone else like to, to chime in or, or we'll I'll move on. Uh, we've got some some questions too that have come in. So we'll we'll get to those about 2.15-ish. Uh, thank you all for sending questions, continue to do so. Um, have you ever been in a situation where you were torn between a typical management consulting approach versus a design-led approach for a client? What did you choose and why? And uh, Sonia, Mariella, any thought on that, Joe? Yeah, okay. Sonia, you've got your, let's talk. Yeah, I can provide an uh, example of a situation. It's from my management consulting days when um, we were, I was on a project, we were redesigning three websites for an insurance client. And one of them was a customer facing website, which was pretty complex. And uh, we were basically, uh, we were basically defining and co-creating the features for this uh, website. So one of the features was uh, claim submission, and that was a pretty complex uh, topic, and it involved a lot of stakeholders from different departments, legal, marketing, claims, uh, and, and so on. So we had two options. The first one is just to go with the traditional uh, management, management consulting approach, such as let's say brainstorm as a team, come up with some solution, like a few options, come up with, the, with prototypes, bring them to the uh, client and get feedback. So, or uh, the second option, we would go with, with the co-creation exercise, invite all the stakeholders uh, to this exercise and uh, try to come up with the solution together. So in terms of uh, how these two options felt to us. Uh, the first one, you know, with the tr traditional approach, it was, it was kind of like um, more familiar, you know, it, it kind of felt a bit safer because this is what we have done in the past and this is, has worked. Maybe not, it's not ideal, but it worked. So the uh, risk was though that uh, we would not come up with a solution 
very fast because you know if it's a very complex solution and it involves a lot of different stakeholders there would be a lot of back and forth so we they would provide feedback we would iterate Again, they would provide feedback, we would iterate. Sometimes there would be conflicting feedback and you, you would have to figure out how to iterate, right? So, and with the second, with the second option, which is the design-led approach, it felt, you know, not as safe because I think uh, Mariela mentioned that, that, and Joe mentioned that, that the whole process is new and you don't even sometimes, you know, not quite sure what kind of outcomes you're gonna come up with and what would be the client, how the client will receive this new experience, right? So, but the potential uh, upside was that we align on this feature together and we co-create this feature together and we come up with a solution and, with, uh, and everybody would be aligned with the solution. And, you know, and just wanted to add, that's also a good uh, break off uh, pace for the client because they're so used to you know just this traditional meetings but you're bringing something more exciting they have to engage you know they have to co-create so that was pretty exciting so in the end we decided to go with the second option we had a good rapport with the client so we thought that even if you know it's very risky we can get away with that if it doesn't go as well so but in the end it actually went really well and we came up with a pretty good solution So yeah, I was listening to words of risky and safe, but when you're on a journey together, it feels a little bit less so as, as you're working together to create a, a solution that you can arrive to something that people are happy with. And if exactly, there's, yeah. if you take a, a, a couple of turns here and there, at least you own it together. It's not just a, a one person trying to direct things. I uh, did not want to know if anyone else wanted to add to it, uh, but um, if not, I will go home and Joe, I'm gonna ask you this. Uh, what are some of your favorite tools, like frameworks or technology that you think are aspiring, uh, this, that you think aspiring design con consultants should know about? Favorite tools or frameworks? I think a really important one to focus on right now is that shift um, to expand out from looking at personas to looking at mindsets. So as designers, we don't look at personas in the way that say marketers do. So marketers are looking at demographics. They're trying to understand um, some of the what about people. And from a design perspective, we wanna understand people's motivations, understand their behaviors, um, what's really driving them. So particularly, as I mentioned, you know, working um, with very large populations with, that might have 50 kinds of personas that use a tool, like imagine, um, all the people who do their taxes online, for example, for the IRS, you have so many different types of people that need services that cut across. So what we're doing a lot of is looking at the mindsets of the folks. What are they trying to accomplish? Um, what's motivating their behaviors? And those types of things cut across many different personas or types of people. So I would say that's a really important shift when you have um, a complex set of stakeholders that you can't just slice and dice into the types of people that they are. That's not really the most important thing to know about them. Um, so that's one. I think um, another is really from my background in service design, and this isn't new, but this is um, super important and I hear less about it in the product world is thinking about the implications of everything for the people who are doing, um, who are touching the product in different ways. So they may be using the product, product to service the final customer. So looking at the employee experience, plus looking at um, the end user's experience, you can have layers of stakeholders and layers of users. And so one of the distinctions between product and service design uh, is that we've typically been talking about products as digital and a service can encompass a real life experience plus digital plus the number of products within that service. Um, so to keep to keep an eye on how that's expanding even more as we start to include AI, as we start to include machine learning, as we augment our human selves with various types of technology, how does that extend the service out in new and different ways. So I think um, that's going to be a really important piece to keep an eye on. Also to think about 
Um, what does it mean now to help people, to enable people to live differently in times of COVID? So as we are now all doing all of these things remote, how can we be helping our customers, um, the folks that we are supporting? How do we enable them using technology to have um, a different real life experience, not just a different experience on the screen? So those are some of the ways of looking at it that I think are changing as fast as the world is changing. So we always need to be looking at how our experiences are affected by new technologies and also new circumstances. I appreciate that, Joe. I think there was actually even part of a question that was that was asked. We'll get to that shortly. We have some good questions coming in about how to engage your continue to engage your clients and uh, mm -hmm. As a result of the pandemic, but uh, but to this other other question around frameworks and technology, I don't know if anyone else had, had other thoughts about this uh, uh, before we move forward. Um, and if not, um, what skills do you all look for in potential teammates? Uh, Mariela, I'm going to I'm looking at you now. Just if you want to kick us off with that. Uh, sure. So I always like people who are adaptable and flexible, and who can look at problems from different perspectives. So. For example, I always tell my, my fellow designers uh, at work to uh, how important it is to understand the business and the technical side of, of that corporate partner's business as well. So uh, just to give you an example, we were working uh, on, a, uh, on building a platform to help people buy generators for their homes, right? So power outage, turn on your generator. So the designers um, were focused only on understanding uh, like customer needs. And obviously we need to understand customer needs for sure. But, um, but, when, so, but what ended up happening is when people talked about how when the power goes out, obviously AC matters or heating matters, but they also care about their computer and they care about their coffee maker. And that was super important for them to, to keep powered. And what ended up happening is the designers were designing a, fl a user flow that took into account every single appliance in somebody's home. And I, and I remember saying like, does anybody, like how does sizing a generator work? And everybody looked at me like with blank stares and I said, okay, let's, let's figure that out first, right? So I built an Excel prototype to figure out how, how do you size a generator, right? And it turns out the only thing that really matters is ACs and water pumps. Everything else will not make a difference and will not make you switch from one generator to the other. So once we understood that, then the design would change, right? So, um, so basically, this is a story just to say it's for me. It's super important to find people who can who can look at the problem in different ways, understand the the very technical aspects because a lot of times, um, right? Especially if you're doing like B two B or or different problems like that, uh, it becomes it becomes really important. So some other skills that I think are super important. Or being a fast learner in consulting. I mean, you jump from project to project and being able to quickly pick up stuff is really important. Being good at storytelling uh, and being a good facilitator, especially as a, a design, as a designer, you're going to be facilitating a lot. And also being a good coach. Um, so we've talked about this a lot of how you have to guide people through the design process and being a good teacher and a good coach and, and helping people feel, uh, get comfortable with the uncomfortable, I think is super important. Uh, and one last thing is good presentation skills. Um, so this is this is very general, but uh, like at consulting firms, you get re a lot of exposure to really high up people. Uh, but a lot of times the way to make yourself uh, visible is to present whenever you get a chance and be awesome at it. So be an amazing presenter. That's a good tip. <laughs> Well, you were very animated with all that. And I think that's wonderful because that is something. And really, these are skills that I'm sure all of you feel are quite important. And, uh, and your excitement and sharing those were, were palpable. Um, I really want to get to the question about trends. Sonia kind of mentioned this uh, uh, earlier. But, uh, and again, we've got some wonderful questions. I want uh, us get to us get started uh, on in about, in about 2.15. But what are some trends you have noticed in design consulting in the past year and what do you think is next for the industry? Now, a lot of, you know, COVID, probably, and please uh, uh, fold in your thoughts about how COVID may have changed, you know, perspectives on this as well. But trends we've noticed in design consulting in the past year, and what do we think is next for the industry? Um, uh, Silky, do you want to start us with that? Uh, sure. Um, you know, I think, I think, this past year has been quite interesting, at least for, for us at 
fan in with an adapt, mainly because I think there's a lot of our clients that are moving digital. Um, a lot of individuals are looking at innovation and less of like the big eye, but more of like a, how can we start to improve some of the smaller pieces? And so as a result, that's been an interesting engagement model. Um, and people are looking at kind of bringing the customer and consumer voice in, in a different capacity, just because I think there's a lot more um, aptitude and or avenue to actually interact more regularly with them, especially as we're exploring different channels. And so I think there's a few different things that are happening, especially over this past year. From a delivering work perspective, I think um, it's been interesting. I mean, when you think about design thinking and ideation and innovation, a lot of it is like, being in a room, whiteboarding, brainstorming together. And so replicating, a, a few of us were chatting about this earlier, is just that we've tried to replicate as much as we can through digital tools and digital mediums, um, you know, like having having uh, virtual whiteboards, et cetera. Nothing really replaces that in-person interaction, of course, um, but, you know, we, we try to, as much as possible, create kind of these immersive workshops in a virtual world or um, bring in other types of collateral that will help kind of spur thinking. Um, the benefit that I am seeing right now in a virtual environment is that the sell to do ethnography or to talk to customers is actually less of a barrier because you have access to more people because in a virtual world, it's just, hey, let's do a Zoom call versus going to someone's home or doing a follow me home or something of that sort. And so I think we're able to kind of talk to more people, hear from more people, get a variety of um, demographics or mindsets. Um, and that's been really helpful in terms of how we start to stitch that um, design process. And so I think those are those are some interesting pieces. I think, as I was mentioning before, some of these macro consumer trends that impact the way that we think about our consumers, especially now and in the future, are really interesting and important. Things that we thought were going to take a long time to change have changed a lot faster when we think about the way people are behaving um, in a digital environment. And so I think that's been a really interesting piece that we've incorporated into our work of understanding, oh, we actually need to shift this change faster. Or when we're looking at adoption curves, it kind of influences the way that we think about um, how people re will react to a, a new form um, or new format of something. And so I think there's an interesting um, time to be in this field, especially since there's a lot of other pieces that are coming in, some things that are made easier, some things that you know we've had to innovate ourselves on how to, how to deliver that same type of value um, in different ways. And so an interesting, an interesting place. No, not to say that it, it's been painless, but um, a good challenge to keep everyone on their toes. But as a result, I think those skills that you need are less on like set frameworks and structures, but more of like the principles of how we apply it and how we can kind of drive towards that same outcome or result in different ways. Um, and so that's been that's been a good trying component for us to figure out this past year. Thank you, Silky, um, very much. I, I wanted to slip this in before our 2.15. I'm determined to try to get some questions from the panelists. They've been wonderful to, to send these in. Uh, and what advice do you have for MBA candidates uh, and graduates who are interested in learning more about the career in design uh, consulting? Sonia, I'm going to start with, with you on that. Oh. For sure. I think Based on my experiences, uh, design consulting exists in so many shapes and forms, and it's structured so differently uh, depending on, you know, in, in different companies and in different firms. So, um, and the, so my advice would be if you are interested in a specific industry or a company to talk to someone in this company to understand how this role is structured. So it could be packaged differently. It could be packaged as a product designer, or it could be packaged as an innovation manager or a product manager. So uh, it's really like, I don't think there is like a set standard across, you know, um, I don't th I think there's a standard how this role is structured. So it's like all, you know, it's all different. So I would I would advise just to learn more about that from uh, people who work in the company and then reach out to to the group that where you feel like you can have exposure to design consulting. 
Thank you, Sonia. Uh, others, Mariella or Joe or Silky? Uh, uh, sure, yeah. So I think for me, uh, uh, something that is super important uh, is to how do you develop the skill sets, right? So I, I really think that design problems exist all around us, right? So I'd encourage people to to create projects for yourselves, to develop the skills that you want, right? So at least at least with DV, so it's quite different than BCG, right? In BCG, they're generalists, they take smart people and they train them. DV does not work like that, right? At DV, we're not generalists, we are part of a cohort, you have a, a set expertise. So you have to, to prove that you are able to do the job, right? So that when you start the job and they put you on a venture, you can lead the work stream, no problem. I always tell people that DV throws you into the deep end and tells you to swim. So you have to be able to swim. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways to develop those skill sets, right? So for example, when I was at Fuqua, I decided to do an independent study. So I had this friend who had a uh, travel app and I said, hey, can I help? And she was thinking of redesigning it. And I was like, hey, I can do this for you. Uh, so I did it for credit and basically I ran an entire design sprint and I I taught myself, I didn't know how to use like at that point sketch. I didn't know how to use that. So I taught myself, I created a prototype. I did the, all the research, all the testing. Um, and then I added that that project to my portfolio, right? So you can find a million opportunities to to develop the skill sets. Uh, so just just try it out, right? And 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 stretch like uh, work on on that on that design muscle. Uh, and a big thing is you you have to have patience. Um, I got my job uh, my internship on the last day of classes of my first year. It was it was it was very. Uh, uh, I, I, it gave me a lot of anxiety, honestly, because everybody had an internship and I did not. Uh, I got my job a week after graduation. Um, so you have to be, you have to know what you're willing to take and what you're not willing to take. And maybe for, for some people, it's more of a some years after graduation type, uh, type career path. Um, so yeah, it, but there's a lot of help out there. Uh, I mean, there's no better place to ask for help than at Fuqua. Um, so yeah, be, be, be sure that we know, we know what you're willing to, 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 to take and what you're not and, and, uh, and find a way to fill in your, your gaps in your skills. Thank you, Mary Ellen. We have about three minutes before, um, I just want to ask one more question. I think it's so, so helpful. And I'm going to put this to, to Joe or Silky. Uh, as many of us, um, students move into the consulting world for summer internships or post-graduation, how do you recommend that we engage in our firm's design studios to take full advantage of the offering? Um, Joe or Silky, who wants to? Joe is smiling. Joe, you want to start? Um, I would say, like everything else in life, you need to put yourself out there and start making those human connections so you can start being part of the conversations that will let you join interesting um, efforts and projects to in keeping with the with the last question which is that basically you need to do things as a designer you can't just learn design by reading about it you have to actually do things so you know join meetups get some experience doing community design projects figure out what you can do and then go and talk to the people who are doing those kinds of things in your organization have enough to talk about that you're like, hey, I know a little bit, but not nearly enough. How else can I learn? And, and just ask. Like, I mean, I think people are very willing to be helpful and engage, but you've got to come with something and it helps to have at least a point of view. <laughs> and if you have a point of view and you come with that, it, it'll get a lot easier, but don't just show up and be like, oh, help me because here I am. That's not helpful. Doesn't really go well. So that would be my thought. Silky, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I agree with a lot of what, what's been said. I think an important first distinction I would encourage everyone to make and to Sonia, to your point is to figure out what this means for you to be in this world. I think um, there's a lot of us, it sounds like on the panel that have a like technical design background or have kind of been in the technical design world. But I think it's important to know that design is more than just technical design. And so if you have the skill set and or the um, experience of going through ethnographic research and being able to solve a problem without ever having to build a, um, 
a UI facing app. Like I, I think that there, there there are different parts of the the process that need to be kind of split apart. And to Sonia's point, like this role exists in many different forms. Like for example, at Bain, I am on an innovation track where I have a design background, but many of my colleagues have um, experience within product and experience within human-centered design, but haven't been a designer. We also have product designers on our team that are the ones that are doing product design. And so I think there's a couple different ways that you can look at this. And then to, to Joe's point, talk to people, talk to the the group that you're part of, um, there's always there's always projects potentially that you can either shadow or hear about, um, hear experiences from other individuals. Um, to Mariella's point, there's probably an experience that's painful to you. Think about how you would reimagine that. Think about who you would talk to and say, hey, I really don't like this app experience. Like, what would I change about it? Even if you can't design it, like create some sort of case for yourself or project for yourself. Um, the last thing I would I would I would want is for people that are super passionate about this topic to be deterred because they feel like they can't be a designer, which is mm -hmm. which is not the end um, goal of what it means to be in design and innovation in consulting. Thank you, Sioki. Uh, well, I wanna uh, thank you all for going through these formalized questions. Now we're gonna take some from the audience and let me uh, shoot these up here. Uh, what are your favorite sources of continuous learning outside of your work? A books or podcasts or something of that nature. So uh, anyone would like to take that? Can let me take a stab at this. So okay, thank I, you, Sonia. I, I think you know, in this era of modern career paths, it's basically continuous learning. So you would have to continue learning. Uh, all your life, your whole life, your whole, you know, during your career. So um, I, for example, just an example with me, I'm uh, working with the engineering team and also data scientists. So I feel like uh, for me, it's really important to um, learn about how engineers work, you know, their mindset, how to build products. So I am taking a web development bootcamp. And prior to that, I really wanted to work with you know, UX designers in a more efficient way, I took a UX online uh, class. So I actually did learn uh, how to use Sketch. I created a prototype of my mobile app. So that was very valuable. And, um, and also, you know, as I'm working, I'm actually right now in the process of transitioning to um, AI ML uh, type of a product. So I actually need to get up to speed on data science. So basically, I feel like as you feel like you are expanding into different areas, uh, into different subject matters, you just you just like just learn, you know, as you go. Thank you, Sonia. All right, there is. Uh, let me. Um, as a facilitator, this is a good one. Have you ever tried to use a tool with your team where the tool just did not work or was not well received by the audience? Maybe the audience just didn't want to participate. Maybe they didn't like, you know, there's just in many ways where people might be a little resistant to, to something. What did you do to, to pivot as a facilitator, to re-energize the team, to engage more uh, with them? I think I may have, maybe I'm, I may have a quick example. So it was actually, I have the, exactly that example. We were trying to, um, you know, as a part of uh, my experience with uh, boutique consulting firm, we were actually working on the new uh, innovation, design innovation process. And we basically piloted it first time with the insurance plan. And uh, we structured it, you know, and then basically we went as we were planning and the client actually started panicking in the first half of the workshop because in the second half, his boss was supposed to join and he felt like it was like going slowly and it was a little more, it's just more than necessary of uh, alignment around the objectives, the icebreakers, you know, uh, some drawing, you know, all the stuff that we should do during the design process. And then I just felt like how he was super tense. 
And then his boss came and actually, fortunately, uh, we got into the actual problem solving part of the workshop, so it went well. So uh, the it was important to pivot during the workshop. If you feel like, you know, some of your exercises are, are, are dragging or, you know, if we are spending too much time on them, just to pivot and, uh, you know, switch faster. Just like kind of watch the audience, which they watch the situation, the environment, and uh, pivot accordingly. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Also, yes, oh, yeah. please, please. I would also say that um, it should not be an objection to a tool. Like before you do yeah. a workshop, before you facilitate, you should make sure that that tool is matched to the level of technological skill of your audience. Plus, you should make it really easy on them so you have a number of backup plans. So for example, um, there is this thing when you have C-suite level folks in workshops where they don't necessarily want to type in front of other people <laughs> they want or take notes. They want someone to do that for them. So what do you do? You set up note takers for them and you make sure that their inputs are like in a virtual workshop are going up on the screen, but they don't have to be the ones typing them. So you have to be really clear about how can you make sure that your participants are comfortable and that the technology fades into the background. And if that means someone else does all the work for them, well, that's okay too. So I think for me, it's a planning thing. Um, I've never had someone object to a tool because I have always spent so much time making it easy for whatever tool it is for them to use it. And so I think um, that's just, you know, a, that's a, that might be a better way to look at it. But the pivot when your audience is like, or your, your participants are like, no, 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 I don't like this is very, very common. I've had people say, this makes no sense. I don't want to do this. And I'm like, all right, then let's not do this. What do you want to do? And then we create something in the moment and do where they want to go. And sometimes that's effective. Sometimes we end up right back where we started. It's okay either way, because the real thing is to get that um, that participation going and get what you need out of it. So I think it's never something to worry about when people don't like what's going on. It's just something to change like everything else. It's kind of like cooking that way. You just change it. <laughs> it is a lot like, like any process and being able to be nimble and agile and go with your audience. Uh, that's an excellent point, Joe. Thank you so much, Sonia, too, for your example. Um, let me add, get a couple more questions for us. Um, how do you evaluate if a project or problem should be tackled using the, the design thinking principles? I'm also curious if there are specific project types or problem characteristics that might have demonstrated superior results by using design thinking principles. Happy to go over that again. But anyone want to tackle that one? I would say complexity is the first thing. Okay. If it was an easy problem that somebody could have solved with some other method, they would have already done that, right? So <laughs> if it's a complex problem, if it's difficult to solve, um, some design thinking folks call it wicked problems. So they are very thorny. There are many issues, many contingencies. They, they're not knowable. So that when you get to the unknown, that's when you want design. When things are very knowable and clear, you don't necessarily need it. Yeah, and I would also add to this, uh, the scope of the problem should be just right. If it's too narrow, you know, you it may not need a design type of like approach, right? It just could be just be done, you know, by just handled by the internal team and it just can iterate based, based on uh, uh, client feedback. Or if it's too broad and it's too kind of like vague, then you, you know, run the risk of actually not, uh, providing, not achieving a tangible outcome as a result of the exercise. So it has to be kind of scoped just right, not too, not too complex, not too, too, not too simple, not too narrow, not too wide. <laughs> so that's based on my experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Uh, Mariela Silke, any, do you all wanna add anything to it before we go yeah, to the next so I would add, I would add um, problems where the solution will impact people, uh, either that people are gonna use your solution or, or they're gonna be impacted by it uh, is another good uh, gauge. 
Very good, thank you. Let's um, go to a next a question. Functionally, on a day-to-day -day basis, how does someone in one of your roles interact with the stereotypical management consulting path roles? For example, associate, project leader, engagement manager. So how, uh, I guess uh, another deeper dive here about your role interacts with the other roles with the career path of the traditional management consultant. Silky, you wanna? Sure. Okay. Um, so at, at Bain in particular, our, our delivery model is to go hand in hand essentially. So every single project that I'm on, it's generally, whether it's majority adapt with a little bit of um, the general consulting side or half and half, it generally is we're going to solve problems together. Um, and this is a result of adapt is homegrown within Bain. And so I think that there's a big cultural capacity and a cultural um, example of the fact that like we all deliver things together. Um, and so our regular engagement model is that we're on one team. Um, we're bringing essentially the design thinking portion or the human centered design portion of the project and working closely with whether someone's building out a financial model, someone's doing some competitive analysis, um, we're understanding kind of feasibility. There's, you know, if you think of the classic like three um, lenses that go into innovation, there's a lot of work to be done across the board to get to a good, good end outcome. And so our principle of how we get towards that outcome generally is to work hand in hand and alongside them. So as a manager, I either will manage the entire team or I will manage um, with a co-manager if we have a big um, general team kind of helping to, to bring some of their work streams to, to light. So it kind of works like that for us at least. Thank you, Silky. I do want to try to slip in a quick question. Now it's going to have to have a quick answer because we have a hard stop in four minutes. So I'm going to just jump in here. What if you're in traditional management consulting and you want to change careers and go into design or design consulting? Any brief thoughts about how to roll into that um, area? I mean, I think, you yeah. know, I, I, I did that from a traditional management consult. So I think it's, uh, it's easy when once you are in management consulting. So if you want to uh, pivot to design consulting, you just kind of like start looking, exploring projects or engagements that are connected to design consulting somehow. It could be like a redesign, it could be like a digital pro uh, product redesign, it could be something else. But basically, as you get more interaction and more exposure, you eventually can transition to, uh, to another role. So basically, I think within consulting, it's relatively easy to get exposure to uh, uh, design consulting work. Yeah, I, I would add, I think exposure, I agree, at least at, at BCG, I think exposure you, you can get. You can go and work at a DB venture, or you can work with somebody from Latinian, which is another business unit within BCG that does more like internal innovation. Um, but I think what, what is important is at least in DV Ventures, like everybody has a very specific role, right? So you're not a generalist. We, you have your very specific role. So if you want to move into another role, you have to somehow develop the skills to say, I would do well as a strategic designer or as a product manager or whatever it is. So I think finding ways to develop that skill set and inevitably that seems to me that you're going to have to do extra stuff outside of work uh, to sort of develop that skill set or, or work closely with, with the strategic designers on the venture that you're on or on the case that you're on. But yeah, developing the skills, I think, is, is, uh, is inevitable that you need to do that, at least at DB. Well, I want to uh, thank you all so much. Uh, uh, it's such a privilege and pleasure to have time with, with each of you today and, and the audience and, and the club has been tremendous to put on this first annual conference and look forward to many more. Mariela, thank you for joining us for Singapore and Silky and Joe and Sonia from New York. And, uh, but I'm gonna briefly, again, thank you uh, uh, for being a part of this great opportunity and great panel. Uh, I'm gonna hand it back over to Valerie so she can close out uh, before we end.
Yes, thank you so much, Mary Beck, for moderating and to all of our wonderful panelists. I think for a lot of MBA students and even people who just aren't involved in the design consulting world, it can seem kind of nebulous and not really transparent how the two worlds, traditional management consulting and design consulting intersect. So I hope that this panel shed a lot of light for our audience members into that. 